Hi everyone, welcome to our Welcome to Women's Entrepreneurs Forum, DC. And if you're just joining us, this is Web DC. And of course, this is our the media panel. Of course, on this panel, um, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Alex Kurji. I'm the founder of the Bragg Media Company and president of G Woman Media Inc. Today we'll be discussing ethics in communication, media, art, and tech. Now, of course, when we think about ethical communication, um, we could, you know, that could be referring to communicating in a way that is clear, concise, truthful, and responsible. But when we talk about, talk about ethics, of course, we're discussing moral principles that govern practitioners and professionals um, within these different sectors. So today we'll be, you know, we'll be talking about the different ethical theories and perspectives, exploring um, changing societal demands and expectations of these different sectors. So today on the panel, I've got with me two other amazing panelists. Um, I'm gonna start off with, our, on my left, I see Dr. Kinger Minish. Um, she is an award-winning international social psychologist, educator, and speaker um, who specializes in emotions, positive psychology, biohacking, and gender. She's also the founder of Viva Voices. Her work solves the needs of emotions by breaking down the complexity of social and cultural concepts tied up inside them. Now, through her extraordinary research, she brings new way of understanding how we can use emotions to be who we want to be, to create impact, and to flourish in life and business. Now she is a social justice, um, so social justice and gender equality obviously have been at the forefront of her work in social entrepreneurship for almost 20 years. And of course she uses the platform Beaver Voices to also create more impact in the world. Now I'm gonna move over to the other amazing panelist on my right, I don't know what that looks like for you, but her name is Alia Lamiers and she is an international multiple award-winning novelist, executive producer, publisher, and host of the Social Good Talk Show on Sugar Coated with Alia. Now, as founder of Unsugar Coded Media, a 501c3 media production enterprise, Lainers is creating social impact storytelling, sorry, while building community, providing education, and ending isolation for trauma survivors. Now, Lainers' role extends to creative leadership in her approach to media, believing that artists are pioneers of the human mind with great potential and responsibility to positively influence society through proper representation. So I want to welcome you, uh, amazing ladies. Uh, thank you for joining us on this panel. And I'm just quickly going to start with Alia. And I'm going to ask you, Alia, what would you say are critical issues in society and what do you what are what are the things that you think um that can be done to resolve the critical issues that we face in society using media as a tool well thank you so much first of all for the opportunity to be here today and you know to speak to such incredible people and to be part of this conversation uh when it comes first of all there are numerous issues in society that you know, affect all of us and, and definitely most importantly, women on a global scale. I think that there's gender-based violence that's seen every day. There's gender inequality, reproductive health and access to healthcare, to services, to mental health, to just a society that embraces and respects a, you know, a person's journey and especially significantly a woman's journey through this world. I mean, these are some of, you know, economic empowerment of those individuals. And one that I think we, you know, definitely don't talk as much about, but we should, would be climate change. I feel that these are all critical areas that policies need to be looking to address, looking to safeguard. Um, you know, there's always things happening in the background, but not all things are good. And where our responsibility in global communications, media arts, and things like that is to provide the transparency that people need to, you know, remind everyone of our social, you know, our social responsibility and be active advocates on all of these issues wherever we are, not just for ourselves and for our families, but additionally for our communities. So that's kind of, you know, I mean, that's exactly so that's much, how that, that is so true. 
Well, thank you. And, and you're right. You know, you share a lot about how, you know, um, we can use, we have the responsibility and, and some of the issues that we're dealing with right now in society. And I, I'm going to quickly um, jump on to Dr. Kinger Minich. Now, I know that um, you have a really broad um, um, experience, both in the media side of things, as well as with dealing with emotions and, of course, you know, social behavior. And when we talk about ethics, um, how do you how do you see ethics in communication, um, in media, arts, and of course technology? What would you say, mm. Alex? Uh, thanks so much for bringing up this question, you know, and just like highlighting it because I think it's actually really important. Um, and the question almost like starts a little bit with a prior question on how do we define ethics, you know, and what is ethical and um, in ethics itself and what is ethical or ethical behavior, what is ethical journalism, how do we... Um, you know, showcase also important matters such as environmental protection, what Ali was just bringing up, and how is that related actually to gender, right, are two things that, for example, are not being covered by our ethics or what ethical behavior or ethical, ethical measures are. Because the way we've defined ethics in society or the way it's being used right now is not necessarily um, an integrative aspect that highlights uh, the diversity in which we live in our world and the diversity that needs to be also highlighted through different ethical um, aspects and practices. I think that's that's an important thing. You know, when we talk about ethics and what is ethical behavior or ethical uh, structures within specifically media, but how do we use and how do we form ethics so they are able to to highlight a diverse diverse society and the diversity that we uh, we have in the world and a diversity that has been really mostly ignored um through ways of how you know business and but also how media is highlighting specific aspects in the in the world and so in itself the question then also becomes is media actually ethical, right? And so, you know, I just had yesterday a really good uh, good conversation. We were just talking about how specific historic um, happenings are being highlighted from different countries. You know, like my, my, my father used to uh, tell me always when I was going to history classes, he said always, remember history is just, you know, it's just one aspect of history that you're learning from this perspective, because if you move countries and you're different in different countries and different cultures, you're going to be seeing a different aspect of history. And I think that when it comes to ethics, that's the same thing. You know, ethics is being perceived and portrayed mostly right now from one specific perspective and one maybe one or few, you know, regions in the world that are really guiding it and therefore also that are guiding how we actually using media in order to highlight um, highlight scenarios that, that just need to be, you know, um, changed or the stories that we need to hear, um, specifically in regards, like when Alia was saying, you know, envi uh, environmental protection. Um, there was an uh, environmental protectionist in, in Kenya and a, a Peace Nobel Prize winner, uh, Magari Matai. Uh, a lot of people don't know about her, you know, specifically right now here in the U.S. Uh, I, you know, every time when I bring her up, people are like, I don't know actually who she is. She was a phenomenal woman. She was incredible. And she was one of the first people to say openly that sustainability and environmental protection is interlinked directly with um gender equality and the ability to create uh, opportunities for women and lift up uh, women worldwide now when we when we if, if we have used you know like how would our world look like if we would have used what she said already i think i believe it was in 1974 how would we actually be highlighting the stories that we are highlighting nowadays um and just like quickly maybe to like bring that all together you know when we look now at media and when we look at the dominating media and the media that we perceive as valid as important there are some media outlets um and there was a great example that was going you know viral uh, also online there's a specific media outlet that when we see people on that cover of that media out uh, outlet we believe that these people are impactful that they are good however we define good but that they are good and that they are powerful and they're going to be building businesses now that one specific media outlet has highlighted actually all 
all the big global tech companies that lately just went down and had very unethical practices in themselves, nevertheless, through media by the general population that have they they haven't been perceived as such. You know, so how do we use media actually in order to highlight the things that are really important in our society? How can we use media in order to try to finally create systematic change and create the equality that we need to create? And I think that that you know that that ethic question just kind of like needs to be almost also diverted on how do we then show what ethic actually is or what ethical behavior is. I love that she said something. Alex, can I? Go ahead, please. I love, you know, thank you, Kinga, for bringing that up because I know exactly what you're speaking to. And I know that for us as a media organization, we always have the opportunity. The reality is a lot of people pay for their publicity. And that's what, you know, I, I remember I was talking to my team yesterday here and they were, they didn't even know, they didn't, they weren't aware people pay to get on top 10 lists of this, that, and the other. And ethics in communications refer to the principles that you utilize to present anything. And so I love that you bring up that question, how do we model ethics? And to me, sometimes it's taking that financial component out of it so that then we really are dealing with more truth and honesty and transparency. And suddenly you don't have the highest bidder getting the, the attention. You have the honest people of integrity that we should be showcasing and putting on a, on a pedestal or, you know, at least a platform, utilizing our platform to showcase in that way. So, yeah, I just love that you say that. I really appreciate that. But it, yeah. Uh, sorry, Alex, I would, if I may just like jump on that one, because I think what's so important and I think that, you know, having um, now the three women, you know, here uh, in this circle and like all, all of us, we work with so such wide, you know, uh, women's communities around the world and we know how hard women are working what they are doing now we also know all the obstacles that these women have to overcome so a lot of women are just not going to choose to do you know pay to play in media right so with that we are already ethically actually uh pushing many of these women out because we are not giving them even the, the ability to tell their story so that is you know that that that's the question then of ethics and then the ethics also, of course, of gen journalism, right? A lot of journalists don't travel anymore. They just like search just on the internet, but not everyone has access to internet. Not everyone ha has, you know, high speed, reliable internet in order to be able to share their story. But at the same time, it becomes really difficult because how do we seep through all the millions and billions of people and find the stories that can be you know, impactful and can make a meaningful change, you know, such as the story of Angari Matai. I mean, that's a story, you know, that should have been highlighted, you know, for so many decades. Uh, I mean, the woman, I think she passed away in, in 2008 uh, at a high age, but I mean, she was around and she was a role model and she should have been portrayed more so even as a role model through media. Well, you know, thank you so much for, you know, for, for bringing that up. And there's something that Alia said about, you know, um, how, you know, the financial component obviously um, is affected in the ethics in media, right? Because if you look at the sort of like the PESO model where people do, um, where, for example, you have paid media, end media, shared media, owned media, there's a whole lot more paid media out there than there is actually earned media where people are earning the opportunity to, you know, for their voices to be heard and amplified based on the work and the impact that they're doing out there. So before, if you saw someone, that was because somebody earned that opportunity to be there. And now it's a lot of paid, like, you know, who, you know, who has the highest box. And, they, and then that's and something you said, because even for someone like me, you know, running um, a media company, one of the things I've always said to people is I was never, ever going to, the cover of the magazine is not a paid for. Right. It needs to be someone who we feel deserves to be there because by virtue of the work that they've done. And of course, when you do that, also there, there there's a price to pay. Right. There is some sort of um, you have to look at it. And, and I guess we, we're going to probably go into the, the part of what an ethical dilemma is like, what would be an ethical dilemma? And you said something about digital. Right. We know that with the portfolio, you know, that just having more people online creating content. For example, that has created more ethical dilemma, right? Because now everyone is a journalist. 
everyone is a content creator. Everyone has access to the exact same, you know, opportunity, right? With social media, anyone can publish anything without having any fact check it, right? Without any, you know, before, if you were going to, you know, run a media, if you were going to put anything out there, you need to own a media house, right? And you need to really have, you know, have editors and all of that. But now anyone could just go on Instagram or Facebook and Twitter or LinkedIn and publish a story, right? Without doing any of that. So I wanted to jump into just some of, um, and, and let's look at even other areas like arts, for example, and how art is very important to sort of, um, you know, culture and history, because I know um, Dr. Kinger, you mentioned something about history and how history is different, right, across different cultures and, and you know, the diversity and what even would be ethical. For example, what might be ethical in Nigeria, where I am, might be different from what might be seen ethical in South Africa or, or even in the U.S., right, just because of the cultures, right, and the social norms and, and all of that. So why it might seem like it's okay for someone to go, you know, on camera and look in a type of way may not be ethical in the African culture just because of some of the things that guide us. So I wanted to jump into, like, what would your thoughts be around certain, because I have these thoughts about certain elements that I think that might be important. So for example, research, right? How important do you think research is for, you know, enhancing, you know, um, just, you know, upleveling ethics? Because I think like, if you look at the area of um, minimizing misrepresentation, how much research do you think should be done, let's say in arts, right? Or in media, for example, how much research do you think it should be done and how much research, how much, um, Effa, do you think that enough people put enough research into some of the content that they create or the things that they put out there? Or do you feel like, you know, their people is just creating stuff? I'd, I'd like to take, I'll take that first. I love that because, you know, it's, it's interesting. I totally <laughs> agree with you. So I want to share an experience that I had when I first started my social good uh, talk podcast talk show. I had a, a, a co-host that I had invited to be part of the journey with me first, and she fell off after the second season. A lovely woman, don't get me wrong in any way, shape, or form. I love her. Alexandra is her name. But I remember after we had had an episode and we were quality controlling it, um, it was determined that something that she had said was actually inaccurate and something that a lot of people will tend to use as a scare tactic, right? Like in... And I remember coming to her afterwards and saying, we are the media. We are, yes, it is, it is so important for us to go and research. And that's, to your point, we do have the internet. It doesn't take much to find out more information about something, f discover the truth, discover the underlying layers behind it that give you a better picture. And at the end of the day, whatever you say on film, on camera, to the rest of the world, you have to be able to stand on that. You know, as influencers, we, and I'm, I'm actually meaning that we influence the world with the content that we create. Um, I, I definitely think the first step is taking responsibility for the words that come out of your mouth or the reports that come out of your content because people are guided by that. People trust you, people believe you, and they assume that because you're in the media, you are taking the steps to make sure what you're saying is truth and valid. So I completely agree with you. And I think that it's 100% our responsibility to make sure that we are doing that due diligence on the information that we present. Thank you so much, Alia. Um, you know, Kinger, I, I wanted to ask you this, and I know you're probably just going to jump in that, but I know that, okay, so for media, we know how important it is to do research because obviously we have to take responsibility of anything that we put out there. But let's look at it in the area of art, for example, say as a singer or as a, an actor or a filmmaker or as a writer or even as a photographer. Like, and you have a little bit of, you know, our um, sort of history with photography. Do you do like any sort of research? Like, you know, what, what would like, what would you say, how important is research, right? Even in these areas of mm -hmm. art, you know, what would you say? You know, I think that it really depends on the area of art that we are talking about, right? I mean, like documentary photography, such as, you know, what's being presented in National Geographic or so, I think that um, is um, 
also art, you know, I mean, some of these photographs, I mean, they have, you know, survived um, decades and are being still used, you know, and are portraying specific significant moments also of our world's history. Um, so I think with specifically artists, you know, there's a subjectivity that comes with it. And I think that artists, interestingly enough, are far more aware of the subjectivity, meaning their own opinion and maybe even so their biases that they carry in when they create this piece of art. Um, and with that, maybe it just creates them a better way to reflect on it because not just in art, but generally in creating any kind of piece that is going to be moved into the pu public eye, right, and can impact the public eye. So be it, you know, a, a song um, or, you know, a, a news news article, right? The thing is that what we need to understand, and that's that has been, I think, so much more, that's something that has been lost in general media outlets, is the ability to stay objective, not that objectivity actually is possible. No one can be really uh, can be really objective. We do carry always a certain form of subjectivity, you know, and otherwise we would have to be able to put down all of our upbringing, our socialization, you know, everything that we've ever learned. And I think that's, you know, it really takes some sort of very highly intelligent person to be able to do that um, continuously. But I think in... In arts, you know, like in when we look at painters and there are some incredible, um, you know, like political painters that are also coming out now. And of course, you know, we all know Pablo Picasso. And I mean, he really moved with, you know, pieces like La, Gre La, the, uh, Grani uh, La Granica. Um, you know, I mean, he really moved, uh, moved people, right? And I don't think that we want necessarily these artists to be objective to something we want their objectivity because they are ob uh, sub uh, sorry we want their subjectivity is that subjectivity because the subjectivity is the the piece of art that they are creating but at the same time we do want them to be informed about what they are talking and so i think that's also you know like even now when i think about that and i think it depends on also which countries you are talking about but it is an art that it's getting lost, you know, the art of research, the art of actually sitting down and having conversations and bringing in different viewpoints, even though we might not agree with them, but at least listening to them and having, you know, maybe and taking them in, in a specific part. So now that I think about that, and that's a, it's, a, it's Alex, it's a really good question. And I didn't, um, I don't know. I, I don't think that I've ever thought about it from that perspective. I think actually that everyone needs to be putting more research into whatever they are creating because nowadays content, you know, and I don't mean content is not art and content is also not news. And I think that that's something that we need to start differentiating with. I think content is most mostly right now being produced in order to perform marketing and PR for someone in some way, however, if it's a company or an individual. And it is just the pure production of more and more and more content in order to drive traffic through the internet. But art is so much more, right? Art is something that survives all of that, that survives us, that survives, you know, the, the history in the moment that we are living in and then it can be taken in. And for that, in order to create something that is really meaningful, and is impactful. I think you you can't do it without without research. Thanks, Alex. Well, you know, I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> I'm glad that you said that because you know, art mirrors society, and for us to create art that actually outlives us, right? It's important to do. I think that you know, I think when you first start off, you're thinking, well, I'll just create whatever comes to my mind. But as you grow, you know, in your art, you start to realize that. There's a lot of research you have to really figure out sometimes the history of even just, you know, what it is. You don't want to create misrepresentation of anything. And this is very simple. Mm -hmm. We've seen it in films, for example, where people are talking about um, maybe an ethnic group or a race or whatever it is without actually doing a little bit of background research on mm -hmm. these groups of people because they actually exist, right? So I always tell people, if you're going to, for example, write a script about a story, you're going to use actual real 
people, like names of real, you know, race or ethnic groups or countries or whatever it is you want to do research because you don't want people coming back to you to say, hey, that's absolutely wrong. That's not how we talk. That's not how we think. That's not how we act. That's not how we dress, you know, all of those things that, and just because of course, again, art always ends up creating some has history around it right and so i feel like this is uh thank you so much for you know mentioning that so i'm going to jump onto the tech side of this because we're going to talk about ethics and communication media art and of course this tech and you know since we've been talking about digital and we've been talking about just content i know you mentioned that king of content we have to look at areas like cybersecurity, for example uh, you know, data protection and privacy, and then maybe even things like, um, you know, things like uh, plagiarism and copyright and IP protection and all, all of these things that allow us to be, um, sometimes if you want to look at, you know, just unethical or even expose ourselves to a whole lot more. So what would you say in the area of technology and how would you say that technology has enabled communication? You know, so I want to look at how technology has enabled it, communication, but also what you might think might be some unethical practices um, with tech. That's such a, it's such a great question. I mean, look, obviously, I think on the forefront, you can't have this conversation in technology right now without bringing up AI. Um, tools such as Jack, uh, excuse me, chat GPT, we have BART that just was rolled out by Google and, and we know now everyone's jumping on. And it's interesting because we utilize that type of technology in our organization to aid and support efforts that we're doing. However, the ethics is when it starts to truly replace the human component. Our creativity, our experiences, our perceptions are what fuel our humanity, what would give us our humanity. And when we start to utilize technology so much so that then it's not really that authentic, you know, um, real, raw, unsugarcoated, if you will, -ness that we need in society so critically right now for a multitude of reasons. And then I think that can be the problem. On the flip side to, to what you said, though, is what, what it can do is it can enable expeditiously a lot of the things that become hangups for entrepreneurs, especially, and I am going to, you know, this is the Women Economic Forum. So I'm going to even talk about like yesterday, I are here in Los Angeles for three days. Our, the school district is on strike. My kid is here. My six year old is here in the her was here in the office with me on one side. I've got a team of people I'm trying to lead and, and organize with. And then I'm having to stop and go do kindergarten <laughs> homework with my six year old. So it, it, we face a lot of challenges in technology enables us to do things in at such a pace to where yes that's when people come to us and say how do you do it how do you manage the family how do you manage the work and then still have time for yourself i definitely think that technology is behind that and i see avenues of ai that can increase that as well as other components within technology, whether it's financing, you know, whether it's just the global networks that we're able to utilize because of platforms and different applications that we utilize. Here we are on StreamYard. We're all in different parts of the world, and yet we can come together and do this for those, you know, for the wonderful people in Washington, D.C. That's what technology can do. And again, I think it is up to us to just make sure we maintain the balance between the humanity and our creativity and our ethical duties as well as as well as what um, what technology brings to us in, in the ways of ease and access. OK, um, that, that's great. I know that we don't have much time left because we have to wrap this up soon and I probably just allow Kinger to do the wrap up. But you said something about, you know, just how technology is helping us. And that's how we're we're actually gathered here today. But you also said something about, you know, being able to be authentic and to be able to sort of um, the emotion, emotional side of this. Because I know that, you know, somebody was saying, OK, how are all you authors all of a sudden writing books with, you know, Jack, with, with Chuck GPT, right? But what about? About the emotions what about the you know that that's supposed to be there because ai doesn't have no emotions so you know a lot about emotions kinga just to wrap this up how would you say that how should we consider the emotions of the audience the reader the you know whatever it is as we continue to produce um you know do work in media or produce art what would you say that we should you know how would you say we should approach that mm -hmm. um well, okay. Let me let me uh, try to 
short net, but a, it's really interesting because I'm receiving tons of requests from AI developers. If I could uh, jump on board and help them, you know, to bring in more emotionality and what does it even mean, you know? Um, so, so far I have, you know, really refused to be part of any of that, even though I do think that we need technology on all levels. And the reason for it is because I think that generally we need to have more women in technology. So in the tech space, being actually part of it. And the more women we do have in there, the more we are going to have also a more all around understanding of what emotions are. And the reason why I'm saying that is just because till, you know, I would almost say till the last 10, 20 years, you know, there were really very few female researchers even in that space in order to give us an understanding what emotions actually are and what they mean. And it's really fascinating what we have learned so far. But while, you know, a lot of male researchers have just portrayed, you know, emotions as one dimensional and as something that has to be controlled and something that we can control in others, the female researchers have actually found very interesting, more diverse aspect to it, such as that, you know, not all of us even experience the same emotions in the same part of the brain. You know, like we experience fear, for example, Aliyah will have it in a different section in their brain and then me. Therefore, we experience already the understanding of it in a different way. So how can we transform something that is just so complex and that is really the 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 crown of all of our senses you know emotions are they bring all our senses together how can we translate that into um something like like tech so yeah i think we need more women i think that's the the, the really the answer we need more women in these spaces yeah so i will you know i will maybe close this for us uh just uh, you know alex is uh, having some, some some difficulties so when it comes to ethics and just like you know speaking hey about how we can bring in ethics also into a more wider conversation it's also really a question of how can we bring more women into these spaces where we are forming uh where we are forming this uh, where we are forming ethics and women there is a significant you know, lack of having women uh, in leadership positions in media and in tech. And that's really something that we can um, or we necessarily have to change and where we have to also support one another and support women in order to uplift them into these positions. So with that, you know, I think that that's maybe um, also a good ending to to what Aliyah was saying, what Alex were uh, bringing up here. I think it's important, you know, to, to see how we can lift the next generation that understands all that technology in order to help us to create a more diverse and fair um, world. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.